The other day, a friend of mine recorded a brief video, it's a couple minutes long, basically telling you what Noahides believe, telling you about the seven Noahide laws, and if that's all you're looking for, I'm going to put a link to that video down below. I'm Steve Perry, this is Biblical Anarchy, and what we're doing here today is a little bit different. I want to look from the Bible and see if I can establish the legitimacy of the Noahide faith in general. Is this a legitimate way to worship God in God's eyes? The only place for us to find that out is from the Bible. So we're going to start out in Genesis 9. Um, this is immediately after the flood. One thing I want to address here is that a lot of people don't do the view the flood story from the Bible as a literal historical narrative of events. That's fine. I don't want you to lose the forest for the trees here. The point of this story is that at the end of the flood, there is one man on earth and his family. Now, whether that's historically true or not doesn't matter for our story. What matters is that this establishes that God is making his covenant with all of mankind. And it's this covenant that we see in Genesis 9. I'm not going to go through the whole covenant. I'm going to go through one law for a very specific reason that will come around later. Um, in Genesis 9 verse 4, we read, But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Um, basically, what he's saying here is don't eat meat from an animal that's still alive. Um, there was a, a practice in the past of basically putting a turn kit on an animal, cutting its leg off because you didn't have refrigeration. How do you keep the, the meat fresh? How do you extend the, the time you have to eat the meat? That was a way of doing it. This is a commandment against that. Now, at this point, we're going to get into some language that's very conventional for us. It would not be conventional for the people of the time. I understand that. We're going to be talking about Judaism, conversion, things like that, things they wouldn't have said at the time. But in, for today's context, we're going to use this language. So I'm going to go forward to the, the book of Ruth. Um, and we see here a woman basically converting to Judaism. If you go to chapter 1, verse, start in verse 16, it says, But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to, return, or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. So this is a complete conversion to Judaism. Why? Because when the laws are given for the nation of Israel, they are given a bunch of extra laws to follow. Not the laws that were given to Noah, although they are accountable for those as well, but they were given more laws that are cultural, um, laws for governing, things like that. When a person of the nations would come to live with the Jewish people. They had to sign on to these extra laws. And what we see here is this commitment from her. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people. That's a cultural thing. Um, where you die, I will die. There I will also be buried. And then a commitment to Hashem, the God of Israel. May, may Hashem do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. So this is a complete commitment to the Jewish people, to the God of Israel, and to their laws made by Ruth. This is a conversion. Not everyone that followed the, the laws, or excuse me, that followed the God of Israel converted to Judaism, though. And we see an example of this in 2 Kings chapter 5. We have an individual by the name of Naaman. <clears throat> and um, Naaman converts so to speak, to the God of Israel, but doesn't become a Jew. He goes back to Syria. Um, starting in verse 15, we read, Then he returned to the man of God and all his company, and he came and stood before him, and he said, Behold, I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel, so accept now a present from your servant. So he's accepting the God of Israel, but he's going to go back to Syria. So in verse 17, then Naaman said, if not, please let there be given to your servant two mule loads of earth. For from now on, your servant will not offer burnt offering or sacrifice to any God but Hashem. In this matter, may Hashem pardon your servant. 
When my master goes into the house of Ramon to worship there, leaning on my arm, and I bow myself in the house of Ramon, when I bow myself in the house of Ramon, Hashem, pardon your servant in this matter, he said to him, go in peace. Now, this is a little odd, because what we have here is a Syrian man <clears throat> saying, allow me to take two, two mule loads of earth because I'm not going to offer a burnt offering or sacrifice to anyone but Hashem. So it seems that he wants to make an altar to the God of Israel. Well, this is following the giving, the giving of the law. And he's speaking to the prophet Elisha here. And so you're not allowed to make a sacrifice just anywhere, right? If you're a Jew. A Noahide can, but he wants to take earth from the land of Israel ground that he considers to be sacred back to make his altar. The other problem is he wants to attend an idolatrous worship service, not for his sake, but for his king. He has his responsibility. He's, a, he's a, um, an officer in the army. It's his responsibility to go with the king. And he says, well, God, forgive me for this. Well, God, allow me to go there as long as I'm not worshiping myself. And Elisha the prophet says, yeah, go in peace. All right. These are violations of the laws given to Israel, but because he's not a convert, again, conventional language, he's a Noahide, right? He's accepting the God of Israel, but he's not taking on Judaism. He's not following the laws of Israel because he's not moving there. He's not going to be part of the people. He's going back home to Syria. He's just going to worship the God of Israel when he gets there. So this is a good picture of what it means to be a Noahide. You're accepting the God of Israel. You're following the laws given to all mankind, but you're not following the laws given specifically to the nation of Israel. Now, we have an example of a larger group of people becoming Noahides in Jonah chapter 3. This is Jonah goes to the people of Nineveh. He's sent by God. Starting in chapter 3, verse 6, the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published throughout Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. No circumcision, no sacrifice to God. All they do here, they sit in sackcloth and ashes, they're fasting and they're praying to God for forgiveness, hoping that God will relent and turn away from the judgment that he's prophesied is coming to them. Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. So here, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is accepting the repentance of the people of Nineveh without a conversion to Judaism. And he's accepting their worship. He forgives their sins. But you kind of get into with Christianity. The view, <clears throat> did Jesus accept it? If we go to the New Testament to Luke 11, I think it establishes here that Jesus accepted the people of Nineveh as being okay with God in the day of judgment. Um, Luke 11 if we go to chapter, or excuse me, to verse 30, Jesus says, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. Okay, now we go down to verse 32. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So here Jesus is saying that on the day of judgment, which if, if you read the New Testament, um, he believes that he's the one that is going to judge people in the end times. And he's saying that on the day of judgment, the people of Nineveh are going to be on his side, standing in judgment against the people of this generation that rejected Jesus. So in the eyes of Jesus, it seems that he views the people of Nineveh as being okay in the day of judgment. Now, 
again, we get into a weird spot because what was true immediately before the crucifixion or the resurrection might not necessarily be true immediately after the resurrection in the Christian worldview. So what were the, as far as the early church goes, what were their thoughts on being a Noahide? And we find this in Acts chapter 15. Um, there's a whole series of events here where they're, they're wondering about Gentile, con what do we do with Gentile converts? And it's a troubling issue to the early church. Do they have to get circumcised? Now, this is an interesting thing. Clearly the early church, understand, what's more important here than what is said is what goes unsaid. It goes unsaid that the Jewish people are still getting circumcised and following the law of Moses after the crucifixion, resurrection, ascension back into heaven, because there would be no question, do the Gentiles have to follow the law? Unless the Jews are following the law. Clearly they were. The discussion is, do the Gentiles have to convert to Judaism? Do they have to get circumcised? Do they have to follow the law? And this is debated earlier in the chapter. And towards the end of the chapter, we get the letter that is sent back to the Gentile believers and this is part of the letter in verse 28. It says, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols, idolatries against the Noahide laws, and from blood, the law we read earlier, and from what has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So this is the early church telling Gentile converts, you still got to follow the Noahide laws. The reason I'm doing this video is because a lot of times I run into people say, well, the rabbis made it up. Like the oral Torah, all this other stuff, the rabbis just make stuff up left and right. This is a very legitimate belief system from the Bible, as you can see from the evidence presented here. In fact, I guess you could say when I first became a Noahide, I didn't know what a Noahide was. I, I, I was reading in the Bible and I was starting to notice these things in, in Tanakh, in the Old Testament. And I started noticing these things and I said, this is what I am. This is what I believe. And after that, I began searching and that's how I came on to the whole Noahide thing. But hopefully... I did a good job presenting the case. You can let me know in the comments below. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, share it on social media. Don't just sit there, do something.